live. Good morning, Sabbath School. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Hope you all had a good week. And we seek to welcome you to this our Sabbath School presentation and discussion. Shall we bow heads as we pray? Loving Father and our God, we thank you for the greatness of your mercy and your loving kindness towards us. We rejoice in the knowledge that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. As we contemplate your word and how to understand better your message to us, please, O oh Father, in your goodness, remove the encumbrances, forgive us of our sins, and be present with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning again, Sabbath School, and we are at lesson six in our series, How to Interpret Scriptures. And the topic for today is, why is interpretation needed? And today we are looking at this in the context of the reader, the context of the person who is coming to scriptures. And so our first text, which is our memory verse, is the one we're going to begin with. Let's read the memory verse. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. So here the conditions are plainly laid out. The first condition being, he who comes to God must believe that he is. So this is an imperative. You have to believe that God is. I said to my wife earlier this week that the Bible is for believers. And indeed it is so. In order to get the message, you have to believe that the messenger is, even though you are not able to see him. And then there's a second condition. The second condition is that you have to be diligent about it. You have to diligently seek him. You have to seek the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength if you are going to get the message that he's trying to communicate to you. Let's look at John chapter 12, verses 44 to 46, to get an enlightenment of what we might be talking about here. Would someone please read that for us? Brother James, need to unmute. Unmute. John 12. Chapter 12. The 46. Yes. Jesus please. cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, if him that sent me i am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness okay so the objective the objective is not to abide in darkness but to see the light of life now, to read the Bible also means to interpret the Bible. Of course, the Bible has different 
kinds of writing. And therefore the interpretation involves understanding the context of the scripture. This itself is an act of interpretation. The Bible has many different kinds of passages. You have parables, you have prophetic symbolic dreams, you have historical knowledge, historical narrative rather, and the question has got to be answered, uh, what is the context of the scripture that you are reading? Of course, we need to be aware that, you know, using the Bible as a magic book is not the intention of the scriptures. Matter of fact, linking passages after passages as we find them can often lead to very strange and wrong conclusions. As has been said, a text without a context quickly becomes a pretext for one's own agenda and ideas. Now, no one comes to the text with a blank mind. That is impossible. Matter of fact, I, I was looking at someone with a blank mind and recognized that it only lasts for a brief moment. My daughter just had a baby, and as she held this baby, I, I saw the baby's eyes looking around, and I said to myself, the baby is developing a schemata by which to judge other things that will come to her mind. But by the time she comes to the scriptures, she would have developed a scheme for evaluating things. It is against this context that we say no one comes to the Bible with a blank mind, but we come with a mind and a life experience that we have developed over some time. So personal experience inevitably impacts the process of interpretation. And sometimes we have strong convictions which either make clearer or prohibit the understanding of the biblical text. But we all hold a number of beliefs about this world, about ultimate reality, about God and other things, things that we presuppose or accept even wittingly or unwittingly. Different people accept reality differently. There are some who do not believe in the supernatural. And there are some who accept the reality of the supernatural. Now, the way that these two individuals perceive scripture will differ. For the person who accepts the reality of the supernatural, then accepting God's supernatural acts in things like creation, in things like the flood and other interventions that God has done in human history from time to time, these are not difficult to accept. But for the one who does not accept the reality of the supernatural, then they have a problem at the outset. Now, total neutrality or absolute objectivity cannot be achieved. Bible study and theological reflection always happens against the background of presuppositions about the nature of the world and the nature of God. The good news, however, is this that the Holy Spirit can open up and correct 
affects our limited perspective and presuppositions when we read the words of scripture. If we come with an open and honest heart. The Bible bears record of this in John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. Would someone please read that for us? I'll read that. I'll be, I'll be reading from the King James Version. Um, John 16, verse 13 says, I'll bet when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. That's right. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So God has not left just his word, but rather he himself attends to his word in the person of his Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Here's a question for you to think about, to think about your own presumption and in what ways you can surrender all of them to God so that the word itself can reshape your ideas to be more in harmony with the reality that the Bible teaches. So the Holy Spirit is able to reshape your presumptions and ideas about reality to make them more in harmony with the reality that the Bible teaches. So our presumptions must be continuously subjected to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that we can have a better grasp of reality. Now, while we have some time, let us look at translations and interpretation. Now, the first thing is that the Bible was written in a very ancient language. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, of course, with a few passages in Aramaic, and the Greek was written in Koine Greek. The Bible has to be translated into a different modern language. And of course, as every translator will tell you, any good translator will tell you, Every translation involves some kind of interpretation. So we had a bit of that this morning here while we were tuning up. Uh, there was some instruction for Brother James, which at first was given in, in, in standard English form and which was later translated in Jamaican vocabulary. So the story is like that. We no longer speak the language that was the language in use when the Bible was written. So it has to be translated. The ideas have to be translated into our modern language so that we can understand. Now for us, of course, that language would be English, but it also has to be translated into the various languages of the world so that other people in their language can understand what the scripture is saying. Now the question of translation, the question of interpretation and translation is not foreign to scripture, as is noted in many of these texts that we would now turn to, starting with 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10.
Let's go. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. I'll read. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy. I'm sorry, I can't see the full screen. Um, and another, and another the working of and another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of tongues. So here we have one of the gifts of the Spirit is interpretation. Let's look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you, hath a, a psalm, had a, hath a doctrine, hath tongue, hath a revelation, hath interpretation, that all things do be done unto edifying. That's right. John chapter 1, verse 41. If his own brother Simon and said unto him, if he interpreted the Christ. That's right. I want you to look at the currents and the recurrence of interpretation. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, there washed and came, seeing. That's right. By interpretation. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which, he, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which he did. Interpretation. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Now Jesus himself. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things according himself, concerning himself. That's right. So in all these passages, the idea of interpretation and translation continues to occur. Especially of note is the one in Luke 24, verse 27. I find that very interesting that the person here doing the translation, the interpretation is Jesus himself. It would have been nice to be there to have Jesus interpreting scripture for us. The crucial point is that unless we are able to read the original language, we only have access to the text through translation. Many translators do a good job of conveying the essential meaning. We need not only rather we do not need to know the original language to be able to understand the crucial truths revealed in scriptures. Yet, even with a good translation, a proper interpretation of the text is necessary and important. That's the key purpose to convey the actual meaning of the Bible text, and most importantly, to help us to help, help us to know how to apply properly the text, both to our lives and to our understanding. And Jesus did that for his followers. So translation 
and interpretation is necessary. Necessary because the text is not in the original language. And if, if, if we have a good translation, then the good translation would translate and bring to us as close as possible the original thought and idea. Of course, some translations are not so good and they lose in the process some essential truths. But many trans some translations are better than others. Uh, and you can explore the, the various translations, but one will find and that, that there is one translation, and it is a translation that is read more than all the other translations, and that is the King James Version. Now, the King James Version does not carry a copyright. The newer translations all have been copyrighted. To get an authority for copyright, then what you have has to be substantially different from any other thing. The problem is that the King James Version would have used some of the best words available to translate the idea. The problem is, however, that even the King James Version, as we now have it, is written in what is not now the common language. So when you read it, you have to be careful as well to make sure that you are translating to your own vocabulary and mind with the help of the Holy Spirit, the various thoughts that are contained. Now we had this important question in another discussion that we had some time, and it is the Bible and culture. The question is, is the Bible bounded by culture? Or more appropriately, how does culture impact the message of scripture? And again, remember we are talking about the approach to you as the reader. How do different cultural backgrounds impact how we evaluate the importance of the various ideas. We have a passage here that we would like to read and then we go in for some discussion. This passage is in Acts chapter 17 verses 16 to 32 and describes how Paul tried to deliver the gospel message in the context of a, a new culture, the culture of the philosophy of, of, of the Greeks. Let's start by reading the passage. The passage is Acts chapter 17, reading verses 16 through 32. Now while what we're, I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, therefore disputed he, he, he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the stock, Stockies encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Others say, others, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into Aristarchus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thus bringing certain strange things to our ears, we could know, we would know therefore that these things mean, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and 
and strangers which were there send their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by and, behold, and beheld your devotion. I found all altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. God that made the world all and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with, made with hands, neither is worshipped with man's hand as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell all of the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitations. Then they speak, then they, sh then they should seek the Lord, if happily, happily they might feel after him and find him, and though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and men's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked, but at now, but now cometh all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world is in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Here be okay. it. Oh. Okay, okay. So Paul was delivering the gospel to a new culture, the Greek philosophers. But they also had presuppositions. The question is, how did those presuppositions affect their willingness to understand and to believe what Paul was saying? We're looking at this so we can understand the need to surrender our own presuppositions when we come to study in the Bible so that we can get the Bible message. Now, a part of their presupposition was that there was an impossibility for the resurrection of the body. They believed, and unfortunately, as many people who now call themselves Christians do believe, that the spirit was something that continued to exist in some other realm after a person had died. So when Paul got to that place, I think this was in verse 32, verse 31, he said, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in all righteousness by that man, whom he hath ordained, whom he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Then their objections came in. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again on this matter. So their preconceptions prevented them from hearing what Paul had to say, even though 
what Paul had to say was in fact truth and reality. Now in terms of Bible and culture, a background of the Near Eastern culture is helpful in understanding some Bible passages. For example, there is a passage that speaks of God's hardening Pharaoh's heart. Well, you would understand that better if you know that in that society, a person is considered to have done that which they could have prevented or didn't influence. So in this case, God is said to have hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, if this were expressed in, 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 in Western cultural language, it wouldn't be expressed like that. It wouldn't be expressed as a direct act of God. So we have to understand that culture also raises some important questions. Most important question though to us is, is the Bible culturally conditioned? That is, does the divine message given in a particular culture applies only to that culture? Or does the divine message given in that particular culture transcends that culture and speaks to all human beings? If we look again at Acts chapter 17, verse 26, we will come across an important point. Before we read that, well, let's read it first. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And at made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and as determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. All right. So the thing is that God has made of one blood all nations to dwell on the face of the earth. So all are humans even though we have a difference in culture in language and in many other aspects yet there are some needs that we have just by being humans the truth of scripture speaks to those human needs rather than to any particular culture it speaks to the human need irrespective of the culture in which you live. For example, the Bible says, thou shall not steal. So this is applicable to whatever culture you live in. The Bible says, thou shall not kill. That's not culturally bound in any way. And if you go through all the principles and truths conveyed in scripture, you will find that they speak to the human need in personal and direct ways. God is the creator of all humanity. Our sinfulness and our need of salvation is not limited to one culture. We all need the salvation offered by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the gospel, the truths of the Bible, is not bound to a particular culture or people. You know, God from the very beginning knew what was going to happen. So when he said to the woman in Genesis that he would come as a seed of for all men, God knew that by the time this happened, in manifestation that there would be many different cultures and many different people but he had to choose one of the many cultures and he did set out that choice early and try to influence that culture although they didn't respond to it 
we find that they, you know, more often than not, strayed away following their own minds and the culture of those that were about, about them. But God had to express those truths that are common to all humanity, irrespective of culture, irrespective of whether those people obeyed or disobeyed him. So we find that the word is applicable to you as an individual and within whatever culture you exist. Because the truths contained in the Bible transcends and supersedes all cultural boundaries. Here is a parallel, and, and I like this. Uh, this, is, this happened in Baghdad, and you know Baghdad has become very popular as a place because there was a, a recent war that had a, a central location in Baghdad. But algebra was invented in the ninth century in Baghdad. Interesting place, interesting people. But is algebra applicable only to the people who lived in the ninth century and only to the people who live in Baghdad? Clearly, the obvious answer is no. Matter of fact, we find that algebra is probably the, the basis of many of the things that we now enjoy in our technological and, and, and modern societal development. Well, the same is true for God's word. The truth it contains are as relevant to us now as they were when they were first addressed to the people in whatever culture or setting it was. The truths of the Bible transcend all cultural norms and is applicable to every human being in every age. So when we come to the world, we have to surrender culture to the superiority of the truths that God seeks to address. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the next subtopic of some of the things that affect our understanding of the Bible. <clears throat> one important one is the fact of who we are. We are by nature sinful and fallen. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 to give us an insight into this matter. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 to give us a glimpse of our situation. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened behind, elated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Okay. So... We have here the vanity of their mind, the vanity of our minds. In other words, left to itself, the mind will accept as real things that, are, that make no sense. Things that are far departed from reality and hence is described as being in darkness, as being alienated from the light of God through ignorance. And it also mentions blindness of the heart. So there is blindness of the mind. That is, you really can't see or visualize the things. And blindness of the heart an unwillingness to believe 
and to accept these things that pertain to the reality. Here are some things, for instance, that pertains to the reality that uh, we have to be led by God to believe these things. Now, the Bible describes that there is present with us on this planet other beings, other intelligences, who our eyes cannot see, except they choose to reveal themselves, and we don't hear their conversations. But they themselves are nevertheless present and participating in the reality of which we are a part. The only thing that can unlock our vision to get a glimpse of what is happening behind the scenes in these realities is the word of God. Let us read John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41 to look at an example of how hindrances can can, can present themselves as to us accepting the realities that God has unveiled. John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, if he, if he were blind, ye should have no sin. But now he say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. All right. So Jesus came into the world to bring light to those dimensions that we are not able to see and understand. Nevertheless, those dimensions are the dimensions of primary importance. Now the problem is some believe that they have an understanding when in fact they probably don't. Jesus says if you confined yourself to believe that you already understand that which in fact you don't understand. You're not going to be cured. There's a little gem, I don't remember who, where it came from and who wrote it, but it says there is none so blind as he who will not see. Jesus outlined something like this in chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Let's turn to that. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believe on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Hmm. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Okay. Now oh, that is a serious situation. Sometimes we look back at these people and, and, and say, how can that be? First thing is that they loved, according to verse 43, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So the focus of their interest was on what they could see and hear without regard to that which is unseen. It's much like an iceberg, you know. The larger part 
of the reality that attends to our existence is the unseen. And it is this that scripture is trying to bring to our attention. There is no question that sin has radically altered, ruptured, and fractured our relationship with God. Therefore, it also affects our ability to interpret scriptures. A prideful person elevates himself or herself over God and his word. And this is because pride leads the interpreter to overemphasize human reason as the final arbiter of truth, of the truths found in the Bible. This attitude diminishes the divine authority of scriptures. So they will say, for instance, well, you know, the Bible says that, but this is what I believe. Well, that is a dangerous attitude. God has warned us about this danger of self-deception. It is possible for you to fool yourself. It is possible to bring yourself to believe that which is not true, that has no bearing in reality. Elder Johnson? Yes, sir. We had a question on the internet which said, um, could you break down, please, how can one see their own sin while in sin? Very well. I think the Bible has the answer to that and maybe someone can help me to find the text the text is somewhere in john and it speaks of what god will do god has said that he had give he has given an agency to deal with that and that person is in fact the holy spirit it says he is come to convict the world of sin and of righteousness. We would like to read that text. But that is how God handles that matter. And that is why the approach to his word has got to be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I think that text is found in John 16, verse 8. Let us read it. All right. Please let us read it. When he comes... Well, uh, let's read from verse 7 for context. But truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Mm -hmm. Verse 8 now. Verse 8. Yes. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit that is being outlined here. And remember that the Holy Spirit is God and is the representative of the Father and the Son. When he is come, please go ahead, sir. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So that is it. It is God that is going to bring to your mind as you surrender yourself to his impression 
what is sin and what is righteousness and in particular our judgment to come. Which comes down to verse 30 in the same passage. It says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. So the person given to guide us into that which is true is the person who is himself the spirit of truth. Very good question. And thank you for that question. So that same spirit, yeah, through his word, has warned us against the high possibility of self-deception. Let's read that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou sayest... I am rich and increased with goods and have not, I have not need of any nothing and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now you see the condition here. Person or persons presume that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But the reality of their condition is that they are poor and blind and naked. Look around you. Those who set their hearts on riches and even have obtained it. Consider themselves, if you talk with many of them, and thank God, not all, that they are rich, and they are increased with goods, and they have need of nothing, but in fact are poor and blind and naked, not knowing the reality of God. And when they come to face death, we find that all those things on which they counted disappears. Interpretation is important. We don't have time to read it, but we will mention that when the temple was being reconstructed after the Babylonian captivity and they come back, that they brought out the scriptures to read. And again, it had to be interpreted to them because many of them had no longer spoke those languages, but God was careful to direct those who spoke both languages to make the understanding plain so that they can understand. The importance of understanding scripture is made plain by Jesus. He sets it in an equation. He says, what does it profit a man on one side of the equation to gain the whole world, so all the riches in the world becomes yours. And when you set that on the other side against losing your own soul, you see that the loss is immeasurable. If we approach and interpret the Bible wrongly, we will come to false conclusions, both in our theology and in the way that we approach life. And let us not believe that this is not happening. And let us not, let us be conversant to know that this was always the case. So in the day when the Apostle Peter and Paul existed, 
you find that folks were misinterpreting the scriptures to their own destruction. As a church and as a people, we must have a clear concept of what God is teaching. Read the message in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, and you will get the thought. Here we say in conclusion, in your study of the word, lay at the door of investigation your preconceived opinions and your hereditary and cultivated ideas. Leave these at the door and come with a contrite heart to hear what the Lord has to say to you. Do not read the word in the light of formal opinions, but with a mind free from prejudice, search it carefully and prayerfully. If, as you read, convictions come, and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Rather, make your opinions fit the word. Do not follow, do not allow what you have believed and practiced in the past to control your understanding. Open the eyes of your mind and behold wondrous things out of the law. Find out what is written and then plant your feet on the eternal rock. The Lord is good to us in that he has given us not only his word, but he has given us himself and his person to interpret to our minds the truths that he's trying to convey if we will submit ourselves to him in humility so that he can shape our ideas so that he can shape our concept and perception of reality to be more in line with the concept and reality as it exists in the truth in Jesus and that we can find salvation in God and that we can have, as he has promised, eternal life. We want to thank you for joining us. We want to encourage you to continue studying these lessons and pay attention to the details so that in due course, you can have God open your eyes that you will behold wondrous things out of his law and that the world unseen, the eternal world, will become a full and functioning part of the reality of your everyday life. God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and let us close with a word of prayer. Our loving Father and our God, you have been so kind that in spite of our blindness, in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our deformity, that you have provided the remedy that will be healing to bring us back under your control even the control and enlightenment of your Holy Spirit. So bless and be with us, we pray, for we ask it for your sake and in your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Of our special music by Brother Franklin. Okay, thank you for that. I wasn't sure if it was me or not. Good morning, New Hope, and good morning, everyone uh, in our online community. Um, it's another blessed Sabbath day, so happy Sabbath. Uh, this song that I was going to sing, I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out what song to sing, and uh, this song spoke to me, so I. Thank you for the opportunity to share it with you. It's called um, Same Sad Song. I hope it's a blessing to you. Sitting at the window of life, watching the world go by. I'm seeing little brothers and sisters with pain and fear in their eyes. I wish I could take them and make them all my own, giving them hope and peace instead of that same old sad song. I will sing unto you a new song, song about love and peace and joy for every man, girl, and boy. And I'm tired of singing about the perils of this life. Seems the world is only moaning and groaning with misery and strife. It's the same old sad song. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw an old man on the street, hurting and so in need. I wish I could take the whole world and place it at his feet. I wish I could change his walk and give him a brand new talk, giving him health and joy instead of that same old sad song. I will sing unto you a new song, a song about love and peace and joy for every man, girl, and boy. And I'm tired of singing about the perils of this life. Seems the world is only moaning and groaning with misery and strife. It's the same old sad song. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will sing a new song, yeah. A song for the whole world to sing. I will lift my voice and cry out telling them jesus is all they need because he gives love joy peace a little understanding oh that will never ever fail i will sing a new song a song for the whole world to sing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same old sad song. Just give God your heartache. Yeah. And he will give a new song. And give God your problems. Yes. And you will sing a new song. Give him your heartaches. And you will sing a new song. Give him your trials. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same old sad song. Thank you.
And now we will be hearing for, from our pastor, Pastor Hay. Um, he's going to be delivering the sermon for us today. Our guest pastor, Pastor Hay, who is the brother of Sister Don Grant. Welcome, Pastor Hay. Good morning, my brother. Good morning to the saints, wherever you are. We're worshiping under unique circumstances. And we just have to thank God that we still have the privilege of worshiping. I'd like to thank Pastor Hollis and the elders for the invitation and the opportunity to worship with you on this beautiful Sabbath and to hopefully sh share a word of hope with you. In the interest of time, I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We thank you for taking us through the week, for blessing us with a good night's rest, and giving us the opportunity to worship together, and more so to worship you. We thank you for your promises and the assurance that you will never leave us or forsake us, even in these dire times. Be with us as we open your word, May we open our minds and our hearts, and may the Holy Spirit have access to deliver the blessings and the hope that he has for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The prophet Isaiah has a lot to say about Jesus. Maybe the most profound passage that he has, however, is in the 53rd chapter of his book, in which he depicts the life of the then still future Messiah as one beset with trouble. True to the prophetic, the earthly life of Christ is a litany of crises after crisis after crisis but for the intervention of god and joseph's midnight flight he would have been murdered before he was two years old and though very little is known of his youthful years things never get better so much so that although his deeds and teachings fill libraries, his ministry lasted a mere three and a half years, brought to an abrupt end at the tender age of 33. So tumultuous were those three and a half years, however, that on the night before his death, kneeling in Gethsemane, his sweat falling to the ground in great drops of blood, the events flashed before his as a temper humanity within him recoiled from it, and in agony. He pled with his father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That prayer, short and simple as it may sound, has two profound lessons to us in 2020 as we deal with and try to navigate a global pandemic. First, it proves to us or teaches us that it is not 
always possible to avoid or revert a crisis. In fact, there are some crises that try as you may, you cannot escape. That's why Jesus specifically prayed, if it be possible. He had left heaven 33 and a half years before on a specific mission. When the angel consoling a doubtful Joseph told him what thing son he said, thou shalt name him Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. When the angels announced his birth to the shepherds that joyful night, they told them, unto you is born in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus himself would make it even clearer when upon beginning his ministry, he declared, the son of man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So although he had done a lot of good in those three and a half years, he knew that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So Jesus knew that to fulfill his mission, his death was inevitable. That, of course, leads us to the second part of his prayer and the second very important lesson that we need to learn and accept today as we face our crises. Jesus submitted himself wholly to God and left the final decision and outcome to his father. Nevertheless, he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. If those of us who today profess to follow Jesus Christians, as we are called, if we would follow him all the way, submitting ourselves and our wills to God's omniscient leading, what a different world it would be. What a different church it would be. Jesus knew, however, that it would not be easy because. We are human, and not just human, but sinful human beings. And so he spent a large part of his short ministry teaching and preparing his disciples then and through the ages to face and deal with the crises we would face down through time until he returns. You see, Jesus knew that time as it progressed would become more and more difficult and confront his people with more and more hardships. When his disciples confronted him, on the Mount of Olives and asked him to tell them what would be the signs of his coming and the end of the world. He, he gave them a litany of things in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. They would hear of wars, of famines, of earthquakes, of pestilences. He said they would see tribulation such as never was upon the earth. 
In fact, in the same passage recorded by the Apostle Luke, Jesus tells them that distress would come upon nations such as they would never even dream of. Yes, if ever that prophecy has been fulfilled, it is now in 2020. The Apostle Paul, writing to his friend Timothy, also saw the crises ahead. And he told him, this we know, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I don't think anyone would disagree if I were to say that those last days are already upon us and perilous times have already began. No doubt about our impending crisis. Jesus left no doubt that we would have hard times and many crises. Writing in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, These things I have told you before they happen, that ye might have peace in the world, ye shall have tribulation. In the world, you shall have tribulation. It is not a might. There is no doubt. It is a fact of prophecy. Tribulations shall come. In fact, in Matthew 20, in sorry, in Luke 21, verse 26, Jesus warns us that as the crises develop and get worse, men's hearts would be failing them for fear of seeing the things that are coming. But Jesus says to his people, we should not fall in that category. God's people, Bible-believing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists in particular, should not be having heart failures about the things we see today. In John chapter 14, we have a passage that forms the foundation of our church and its beliefs. It is one of the most well-known passages of scripture by any and every Seventh-day Adventist. We refer to it as the Lord's promise. The problem is, however, that we have tended throughout our history to place the emphasis on that passage in the wrong place. In reading the passage, which we all know very clearly, the Lord says to us, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We as Adventists and many others have emphasized and looked forward to the promise of the return. And in so doing, we have very lightly passed over the first two statements that Jesus has made. 
in the very first sentence, he gives us a bit of admonition. Let not your heart be troubled. Do not have high blood pressure. Do not sit up at night wringing your hands. Do not worry about the economy and the stock market. Sad as it is, do not be overwhelmed by the disease and its sickness and even the deaths that it caused. Let not your heart be troubled. That statement has nothing to do with the mansions that Jesus is preparing. There will be no heartache. There will be no fear. There will be no tears in heaven, thank God. So when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, he is obviously warning us about the lives we live and the approaches we take to the things happening about us in the end of times. His second admonition is, you believe in God, believe also in me. Put your trust in God. God and his son are preparing a place for us. Trust him to take us there. Do not trust in men. Do not put your trust in people around us who know nothing more about the crises than we do. You see, throughout his word, God has left his people many sure prophecies. In the 91st Psalm, he promises to take care of his people, to protect them from diseases and all the other problems. He says, thousands will fall at your right hand. Ten thousands will fall at your side, but be not the dismayed. God will take care of you. In Isaiah 42, verses 2 and 3, he says that when you pass through the water, it will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. God has proven time and time again that he can protect and provide and take care of his people. In Isaiah 33, verse 16, he tells us not to worry about the shortages in the supermarket and the stores. Don't worry about what you don't have. When you trust and follow God, he has promised us to hide us in the rocks, whether physically or proverbially. And his promise is that bread will be given to us and our water will be sure. Isaiah 33, verse 16. He says, He will uphold us and defend us with His mighty right hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10. And so instead of worrying and fretting, we need to take God at His word. There is a famous saying the proof of the pudding is in the eating and that is is very true in regards to the words of god god does not make these promises in a vacuum god does not expect us to be blind in our faith he gives us ample evidence of what he has done in the past he took care of Jacob and his family during the famine. 
by sending Joseph ahead, as difficult as his being enslaved was. Elijah was fed by ravers and by a widow when famine engulfed his land. The three Hebrew boys were saved in the fire. And notice I said, in the fire, we as Christians tend to have this habit of praying and asking God to save us from problems, to take us out of trouble. But let me remind you that Jesus didn't prevent the boys from going in the fire. What he did was to enter the fire and prevent even the hair on their bodies from being singed. Likewise, Daniel placed among hungry, ravenous lions was able to lie down and sleep the king that put him in the lion's den couldn't sleep a wink that night. Daniel rested in the care and comfort of his God and slept well. Yes, some three million Israelites were taken across the Red Sea with no ocean liner. No boat, yet God delivered them safely on the other side. The songwriter Jim Reeves often sang a song, the chorus of which encourages us, do not be discouraged, for I bring hope for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he has done for others, he'll do for you. That is why Jesus encourages us, let not your heart be troubled. The only question as we face our crises is how much and who will we trust? When you turn up at the doctor, and he tells you, my sister, my brother, I see a spot on your lung or on your kidney. Do you go home in despair and wring your hands? Or do you pray and trust God, not my will, but thine be done? When a family is distraught or destroyed, because of an unfaithful spouse or an unruly child, do you give up and throw your hands up in the air or do you trust the Almighty? When the economy and the morale of a country is shattered, does that mean the end? Does that mean that we give up or do we say, Lord, into your hands I commit my life. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Yes, the pandemic has wrought panic and disaster upon the world. At the last check, I understand that some 153 countries of the world have been afflicted by this disaster. Almost four million cases have been proven positive. Nearly a quarter million people have already died. Here in the US, one and a quarter million have already been tested positive. More than 78,000 are dead. Things look dark. Things look pessimistic. And to use an old cliche, what we need to determine as Seventh-day Adventists 
and children of God is whether or not the glass is half full or half empty. If you listen to CNN, ABC, NBC, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Journal Constitution, you have a choice whether you want to listen to them and believe fake news or you want to listen to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and receive good news. Who will you listen to? Trump, McConnell, Pelosi, Andrew Cuomo, Brian Kemp, or will you listen to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, Paul, and above all, Jesus Christ? You see, Paul's advice is that we should not listen to those who purvey bad news. He said, put no confidence in men, whether politicians or scientists, even those who project them as theological experts, because when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon the land as a war in travail. Someone called me the other day, and in the course of speaking, she asked me, Pastor, do you think that God is punishing us, the world in general, and Seventh-day Adventists in particular? I said to her, my sister, God is not punishing us or anyone. This is not God's punishment. This pandemic, coronavirus, COVID-19, the shattered economy, all of them are God's visual aids in the school of life. For the first time at last, many people are beginning to realize that the essential people of life are not the multimillionaire athletes who we waste time watching, not the makers and breakers on Wall Street, not those who believe they have all power in Washington and Albany and other places. God wants us to know that he is still on the throne. He still controls the affairs of men. And we need to understand that what we are seeing today what we are experiencing in 2020 is just the tip of the iceberg because there is coming a day and there are coming events that will make 2020 and the pandemic look like a child's tea party. Writing in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, the prophet warns us that a time of trouble is coming upon the world that has never been since the world began. Jeremiah speaks of it in Jeremiah 30 verse seven as the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, 21 of a time when tribulation would come upon us as a woman in travail. And Jeremiah asked us a question that we all need to stop and think. 
and contemplate in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, he asked us, Jeremiah 12, verse 5, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou treadest, they wearied thee, how will you stand in the swelling of Jordan? As Seventh day Adventists, we have taught and preached that the day would come when we would not be able to gather in churches as we are accustomed to. But we anticipated that that would come about because of persecution and the police and the army and others would be searching us down to shoot us and to kill us. No one foresaw a day of peace and quiet when for months we have not been able to meet together as God's people. And Jeremiah is saying, if one little pandemic has caused the world to turn upside down and caused many Christians to question God's authority, God's power, what will we do when we face the swelling of Jordan? What will we do when the seven last plagues are unleashed? Just when we think we have overcome this pandemic and we begin to open up as many states and the country are doing. And just as we settle back in, the second plague comes. And a few months later, just as we settle in again, the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh play comes. How will we deal with it? Yes, God is saying to us that we need to place our priorities right, saints. Even as Seventh day Adventists, many of us have allowed the pleasures and the cares of this world to distract us from our mission and our commission from God. And Jesus is saying to us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put God back where he belongs as the center and circumference of our lives, of our church. Many of the things in which we engage are just for our human pleasure, just to satisfy our egos. We have removed God and his word from the centerpiece of our lives. Too many of us bow at the altar of music and sports and entertainment and all that the devil has to attract us and distract us. God is saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. He promises that our bread and our water shall be sure. He doesn't promise us butter on the bread, nor does he promise us sugar or milk in the water. Many of us have forgotten that God's promise is to supply our needs, not our wants. And this pandemic has caused many of us to realize that many of the things that we thought we could not do away with were only to satisfy our human depravities. The essential things of life God has promised to provide. Remember the advice given to us by Peter in 1 Peter 5 verse 7. 
He says, cast all your cares upon God because he will care for us. Don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus knows from experience what it is to live in a world of sin. That is why he's even now preparing a place for us. And that's where the second half of the Lord's promise, John 14, 1 to 3, comes in. He says he is preparing a place for us. And one day soon, he will come again to take us back. The question is, are we preparing for him as he prepares for us? The Bible tells us that these things, both those in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and even the things that are happening to us now, are happening and are written for our admonition, our warning, upon whom the ends of the earth have come. And Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 15, verse 4, tells us that these things are permitted by God to build our patience, and through the building of our patience, to build hope. You see, God has a message for you and for me. If you turn to, I, to Amos chapter 6, I'm not going to read it, but in Amos chapter 4, I'm sorry, Amos chapter 4, verses 6 to 12, the prophet outlines a number of calamities that befell ancient Israel. Famines pestilence, disasters, hardships, all sort of different calamities. And after each one, they would harden their heart and turn back to their wicked ways. And then in verse 12 of the chapter, Amos chapter 6 and verse 12, I'm sorry, Amos, chapter 4 and verse 12 God says therefore thus will I do unto thee O Israel and because I will do this unto thee prepare to meet thy God O Israel in other words God is saying that yes he permitted these hardships he allowed these disasters to come to teach israel what is important in their lives to help them to see that what solomon said in ecclesiastes 14 is true vanity of vanities all is vanities and so he sends us yet another message through the prophet Hosea in chapter 10 and verse 12 he says sow to yourself in righteousness reap in mercy break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon us. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave us that promise that he will come again. Ever since his followers throughout the entire New Testament, every book was given to teach us the way of God and to prepare us, prepare us to meet him when he comes. But by the time Peter wrote his epistle, everyone 
including many of those who should have known better, had turned to the world and had began to ridicule the promise of God. In 2 Peter 3, they ask, where is the promise of his coming? But Peter says, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And then in verse 9, he reminds us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God speaks to us through prosperity. He blesses us. And if we as his children were faithful and appreciative of the blessings, instead of complaining of what we don't have, we would constantly be singing his praises and thanking him for what we do have. And the people of the world would be led to ask us what makes us so joyful even in the times of crises, even in the times of a pandemic, even when people are dying on our right and our left. How can we be so hopeful? How can we be praising God. But when we fail to recognize him through our blessings, he sends adversity. And these adversities are not to destroy us, but to draw us to him. Yes, he that cometh will come. And he invites us as his followers to come to him. His promise is that he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And he says to you again in John chapter 6, verse 37, Fear not, my little children. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus has been preparing the mansions. I believe with all my heart that he has really finished the preparation. Soon and very soon, that little cloud the size of a man's hand will be seen in the eastern sky. Soon and very soon, the trumpets of the archangels will be heard. And as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, from one corner of the globe to the other, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The question is, will you be ready? Before Jesus comes for us, he comes to us. And so in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, he invites you and me, not just the non Adventist, not just the heathen. Many of us who profess to be Adventists, but in reality are more bad Ventists or even sad Ventists. 
He says, come now. Let's talk it over. Though your sins are many, though they be red like crimson, I'll make them white as snow. Jesus's invitation is still open. The doors of mercy are still open. As you read, as you see, as you talk about the pandemic of 2020, the hardships and the deprivations, the social distancing, all the problems that we see and hear, remember the words of God. Remember the words of his son. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Jesus Christ. For his message to you is, behold, I come quickly. The admonition of John the Revelator is, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Eternal God and Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your message of hope. We thank you for your many, many promises. We thank you that because of the experiences of your people down through the ages, we know and are assured that you are not slack concerning your promises. We thank you for your long suffering and mercy. Because many of us speaking, many of us hearing, many of us reading, many of us professing your name are not as ready as we need to be. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord wrestle with us remind us to search the scriptures for in them we will find eternal life and when we find it may we bite and sell it not may we determine like the hebrew boys that even if you choose not to deliver us from this pandemic and the crises that lie ahead, we still will not bow the knee to Baal. Let us, Lord, by your grace and through your strength, determine with Job that though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Forgive us of our sins. Keep us faithful. And save us when you come, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you, saints. I hope and pray that you have been blessed, that you've gotten something from the message. And it is my prayer that God will hover over you, protect you, keep you in his care, provide for you. But more than anything else, remind you that this world is not our home. We are just a passing through. If we never meet again, by God's grace, let us meet on the sea of glass. God bless you and goodbye.
Thank you, Pastor Hay. Thank you for your message of hope. And we pray the same for you, that God will bless you. Please continue to bear with us a little while longer while we bring you some important announcements. It's Mother's Day weekend, and we want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. May God bless all the mothers who are listening. We continue to do fasting and prayer weekly, every Wednesday, and we continue to focus on the world conditions and our relationship with Christ and our readiness for his soon coming. Again, you can find community services uh, regular uh, by contacting Novlet Forrester at 404-660-2618. Regular basket distribution will be on the third Sunday, May 17th. Reflections on the life of Zalima Howard, that's wife of Pastor Daryl Howard, will be on Thursday, May 14th, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Willie A. Watkins West End Chapel. And the address is on the screen. It's open to the public, but masks are required. Some more updates. Patricia Beasley is recovering from surgery and she's likely at home. Please continue to keep her in special prayer. And the mother and brother of sister Sharon McLean are being treated for COVID-19. We're requesting prayers for, for them. And as usual, we continue to provide information about how you can return your tithe and offering can go online on our church website, www.nhsdachurch.org. Click the online button on the top right. Or you can mail your offerings to New Hope SDA, PO Box 370-688, Decatur, Georgia, 30037. Thank you very much and continue to have a blessed day.